Amen. Okay, so my aim for last week was Philippians 2, 14 through 15, and it's still the same. And I'll read it again. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. I'm actually going to focus on that today on a few different passages um, because I think that's directly linked to thanksgiving as a, as a characteristic, as an outflowing of the Christian. He says, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So if we want to be witnesses, we've got to be thankful people. If we're not thankful people, you're not helping. And so I just feel really convicted about that, especially in our work environments, uh, as inflation, as gas prices are going higher and higher, as people are becoming more unreasonable um, and goofy, just in terms of um, just a lot of craziness going on out there. And I feel as though that this is an area that is lacking, and this is where churches need to really explode. We really need to be exploding in gratitude and praise towards God, not just praise and, and thanksgiving in general. And so I kind of want to recap from last week. We were in Psalms 50, and what we, what we learned from that is that in verses 9 through 13 in Psalms 50 is that a lot of grumbling is based on what we believe about God. It's rooted in what we believe about God. And God's argument to grumbling, hypocritical worship and service, which is what Psalms 50 is about and what he's calling out, is do we really believe that God owns all things? We trust that God is in control of all things, do we, but do we believe that God actually owns all things? That everything that you have is a gift. And that's not cliche, it's true, right? It's true. God owns all things. And we get grumbling and hypocritical service, and we read in Deuteronomy 28, 47, that there's a type of service that God doesn't like. Deuteronomy 28, 47 says, since you do not see fit to serve the Lord your God with happiness and joyfulness of heart, you will serve your enemies. There's a type of service he doesn't like. And so this is a deep root heart issue. That's the other thing that we discussed as well. And I made a kind of a blanket statement last week that didn't really explain it. We were in Jude 15 through 16, and I asked the question, you know, because in Jude 15 and 16, Christ and all his angels and hosts are going to come back and execute judgment on the ungodly. And the first in that list of ungodly were grumblers. And my question was, is, well, why is that first on the list? And we kind of talked about that and kind of touched on it. And I made a statement that was, um, I said, only Christians have thanksgiving to God. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Christian character. Unbelievers do not have this characteristic. And I'm actually going to show in a passage where an unbeliever, an unsaved person can thank God till they're blue in the face and still not be justified. And there's plenty of examples, but I'm choosing one for the sake of time. So, kind of my focus today is, it is on Thanksgiving, but it's a lot more focused on of what's it's rooted in, what's it springing from, and it's springing from the gospel and the new birth, being born again. Um, Ephesians 5, 1 through 5, is where we'll kind of, it's our anchor, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of stay in that, and then we're going to kind of branch off from there a little bit. Um, let me read Ephesians 5, 1 through 5, and then we'll kind of pick at it. So, Ephesians 5, 1 through 5, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. You may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. First focus point is in verse 1. Let there be, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. There's a man by the name of Frank Cerrone. He was my teacher of the book of Acts when I went to Bible college. He's a professor at um, Ravencrest Bible College in Estes Park, Colorado. And he had a very good analogy with this. He said he'd have college kids over at the house and they'd have lunch and or dinner or whatever, and the kids, he was kind of a goofy guy. He always had a lot of goofy mannerisms and stuff, and, and the kids liked to make fun of him. They'd mimic his activities, how he talked, and all these different things, and it was a lot of fun. 
But then he noticed what morning as he was doing his devotions. He saw his son get up in his skippies, walk down the stairs, go and get a glass of milk, and walk right back into his bedroom. And his son walked and acted just like he did, without even trying. He was imitating him. There's people who mimic God, and then there's people who imitate God. What's the difference? His son was of him. His students were not his kids. His blood flows through his son's veins. If Christ is in you, you're not mimicking Jesus. You're imitating Jesus. You have to be his child. If you're not, as beloved children, be imitators of God. That's not doable if you're not a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God. You are a creature of God, but not everyone is a child of God. And that's something that we miss. And we sometimes get it backwards. But like, looking at Romans 8, I actually want to turn there real quick. Just keep your fingers in Ephesians 1 through 5. Romans 8, 1 through 12, 11. I'll read that. And I hope you kind of get to see that picture. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according, that word according means in harmony with, live in harmony with the flesh, set their minds on things in the flesh. Those who live according or in harmony with the Spirit, set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. You cannot submit to God's law. That's when I made that statement, you you know, Thanksgiving is a Christian characteristic. It's not an unbeliever's characteristic. The Thanksgiving we're talking about is praise and honor to God fully in our hearts is from a redeemed state. And so without the Holy Spirit, you cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 8. 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. <clears throat> if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. I like how Paul adds that, if, in fact. Always to throw a little bit of, like, examine yourselves to see whether you're not in your faith. It made me think of a question that he asked back in Acts chapter 19, verse 2. He's going to the church of Ephesus, and there's about 20 guys there. And he goes, so did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? How many of you have ever been asked that question? <laughs> right? Have you ever, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? A lot of people have never been asked that question. But that was a question. Paul was like, I'm glad you believed in the baptism and the gospel, but you need the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. Remember the analogy of the glove last week? You know, I can teach a glove and tell a glove by itself on the floor to move that chair, but it won't do anything unless the hand is in it. Unless Christ is in you, you will not live the way you're supposed to. Like a lamp without oil is not a lamp. It's the paperweight. Unless oil is in the lamp, it will not act the way it was built. Same with man without God. And so, and then verses, let me keep going, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Do we believe that? It's the only way you're going to conquer sin. Um, uh, I like that quote. I quoted Major Ian Thomas last week uh, with that glove analogy. He also says, the only person who was able to live the Christian life was Christ. The only person who was able to do it. And he now lives in you, right? And so what power do we have? You know, there's a, uh, this week was really was incredibly busy. I drove all the way to Beartooth Pass on the other side of Chief Joseph, Joseph and back in one day, and I got to do it at midnight tonight. So, uh, so this week was just kind of like, oh yeah. So I just listened to sermons and sermons and sermons and one guy was talking about the new birth. It had nothing to do with what I was talking about in terms of Thanksgiving, but he used the analogy about honey. He says, like, if your tongue taste buds are alive and you try honey, no one needs to explain to you that honey is sweet. But if your taste buds are dead, you have to read about it, take it, second guess it. You know what I mean? You got... You, you, always, you always have to pretend that you know that it's sweet. Unless your taste buds are alive, 
You'll never taste. It says, what, 1 Peter 2, 3? And if indeed you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Have you tasted the Lord? Christians know that God is sweet. You know, we don't just go, well, I read it in a book, and that's what, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm just supposed to do that. I'm just supposed to do things. First starts, do you love God? Remember when Jesus said, Matt, John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We've associated love is equal just to commandments. It's not. Commandments flow from love. They're not, the res- they're not, they don't produce love. They flow from. And so people kind of get that backwards, and it's like, it's very easy to mimic good works. You know, un- you know, unbelievers can mimic going to church, sing the songs. I just had a really sad conversation with one of my roommates at Bible college. He's in the military now, and he goes, yeah, pretty much during that whole time, I just was learning to say the right things. That was it. You know, he has no walk with the Lord whatsoever. He's just like, I fooled just about every one of you. And um, that really hit home. You know, just because you just, yeah, it just was really sad. And so, back to Ephesians 5, 1 through 5. And so, hopefully, that's kind of the basis where I'm coming from, is being born again. You've got to be born again in order to have this. But my next question is this, is verse 4, why is thanksgiving the instead of, of all those nasty sins? You know, Paul could have used contentment, because remember we talked about in Psalms 50 last week, you know, about the adulterer and the thief. You know, it's like, why would he use those two as an example? Well, an adulterer and a thief are not content with what they have. You don't believe what God, what, that God owns everything, and the wife or the husband that you have is not enough, so therefore you cheat. The stuff that you own is not enough, so you steal. It all comes back down to the theology of God. But that's not what he used. He uses the word thanksgiving, and I'm wondering why. And what, if you look at it, it says in verse 5, it says, whoever is covetous, that is an idolater. It's idolatry. Covetousness, adultery, sexual morality is adultery. You've completely rejected God's authority. You're your own God. I choose whatever I like, whatever I please. And therefore, it's hard for you to actually give thanksgiving. So thanksgiving is rooted in a proper understanding, as I've said, of God. And it's a turning away from idolatry. It's a turning away from idolatry. Grumbling is idolatry. That's why in Jude 15 through 16, it's such a big deal. Because it's rooted in idolatry. Either you're your own God or something else that you love more than God. Anything you love more than God is an idol. Anything you love more than God is an idol. And so Luke 18... Verses 19 through 14, there was the parable of, um, you can go there if you want and look at it. I would suggest you do that. But the, I won't read through it all, but um, the story where Jesus tells the parable of the two men that went up to the temple. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector. And what was the first four words out of that Pharisee's mouth, according to my translation? Lord, I thank you that I am not like other men. So you can thank God and be dead as a doornail. If you're not born again, all you're thanking God for is your idols. God, thank you, I live in Montana. (laughs) Still be dead. Thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. You know, we just, it's just, you know, if you're not born again, all you're thanking God for is your idols. And you can thank God all day long for all the good things and never have a really care and love for Christ, love for God. That was really convicting looking at that because I remember you preached on that a few weeks ago, Luke 18, you, you, on the words in red a few weeks ago. And that caught my attention, those first four words. Lord, I thank you. So there's a way of where we can thank God and still be, still be off. If God is not your love or trust or treasure, you'll never thank him when, when times are good. You'll only thank him when times are good. Times are bad, you're, you're gone. So what's your root for your thanksgiving? You know, if you find yourself only being able to thank God when times are good and when times are bad, what's your foundation? Remember what Jesus said in the end of a Sermon on the Mount, he who builds on the rock and builds on the sand. When times are hard and your house crumbles, you know, you gotta understand what's, what's, your, what's your basis. So if you're more prone to sin when times are hard, you know, you got to ask what your foundation is. Is it sand or is it the rock? And so is our thanksgiving. It's a good sign and test of that. Psalm 78, let's go there. I'm almost done. I, I didn't have much long on this, but 
Psalm 78. <clears throat> I just wanted to give a picture and see this. Um, 12 through, 12 through 13 are the verses I want to read. If you ever read through Psalm 78, it pretty much tells the whole story of why Israel was not obeying God. Um, it's one of my favorite psalms because it's just so explicit. There's no, like, um, over poetry. It's just simply just telling the story. Um, but verse 12, starting in verse 12. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it. He made the waters stand like a heap. Meaning you can see a lot of, everyone talks about their experiences with God. Experiences are just experiences. Okay? You know, I mean, that, that's not the basis of your faith. As you can see here, they had all these experiences. They saw water split, mountains broke open for water, and still did not believe. Christ was here among us, and they still murdered him. It's not the abundance of signs that we need, and everyone's looking for some, it's, it's not faith. And as we can see, it's a far deeper issue. Verse, eight, verse 15, he split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made steam come, streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow like rivers. Yet they still sinned more against him, rebelling against the most high in the desert. They tested God in their heart. They demanded the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Remember when they tested God? I said last week that testing is, is, is asking, Is God actually good? That was the three temptations that Satan gave to Jesus in the wilderness when he was out for 40 days. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Because the Word says, you know, the angels will keep you from falling and stumbling unless you stack, strike your foot against a stone. Test to see if God's actually going to do that. That's testing God. It's a total unbelief in his goodness. And that's what Israel did time and time again. If you want to read Exodus all the way through the prophets, that was the main problem. They did not believe God was good. And it's still the problem today. Many people believe in God, but when times are hard, is God still good? Absolutely. And that's a challenge for me every day. Satan goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What's he here to devour? Faith. That's what he's here to devour. Faith is what destroys you or keeps you right? You know, what's the, I just, the, one of the sermons I was listening to on the way up to, up to the mountain was, he was talking about, um, <clears throat> oh, I just lost my thought, forget it, never mind, it happens, never mind, apparently I didn't need to say it. Okay, verse 17, yet they still sin more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved, they spoke against God, saying, can you spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the walk, rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread and provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard this, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob, and his anger rose against Israel because they did not believe in God. Grumbling is based in unbelief. Yeah. Always based in unbelief. And they did not trust his saving power. Yet he, in his mercy, I added that, commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven and he rained down the manna to eat. And he gave them grain of heaven and man ate the bread of the angels. And he sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow into heavens and by his power he let out the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust and winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall in the midst of their camp all around in their dwellings. And they ate and they were filled for he gave them what they craved. But before they had satisfied their craving while the food was still in their mouths the anger of God rose against them and he killed the strongest of them and laid low the young men of Israel in spite of all this they still sinned despite his wonders they did not believe your problem if with our faithfulness is not that we lack signs it's not that we lack miracles it's that our hearts are not faithful our hearts do not believe and that's our challenge every day is not your work, not your difficult coworkers. I'm saying this more to myself, um, or difficult people that you run into on a daily basis, the crazy nonsense you're seeing on social media and what's going around in the world. The problem is, is do you enjoy God? Do you love God? Do you enjoy prayer? Do you enjoy communing with him? You know, just as, as honey is sweet to the tongue, is Christ sweet to you? Christ should be sweet to the palate of the Christian. You know, we get so focused on, well, I'm going to church, I'm praying, I'm doing my, I'm doing, the, I'm, I'm leading adult Bible study. You know, I'm doing that. 
you know, but it's like, do I enjoy God? Does Dylan Workman enjoy God? And that's, that's, that's your big challenge. That's what Satan wants to devour, because if you don't have that, you're useless. Remember what Christ said in John 15? I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, that's really all I have. But again, if you're not born again, all you'll thank God for is your idols. Is God your king? And so, let me just pray real quick and we'll close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you are God. There is no one besides you. There is no other God that cares for us, that forgives iniquity, forgives sin, who is merciful to us, Lord, and just how undeserving we are for every good gift. And so everything we should have should always cause us to thank you. The clothes we have, the church we have, the cars, and all the material blessings that you've given us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they don't close our eyes to you, Lord. God, that we can see your glory and that we can enjoy it Help us, Lord, if there's anyone in here. Help me, Lord, if there's a dryness, if there's a, a lack of joy in knowing you and seeking you, if there's someone in here who has no desire to seek you, um, who has lived the double life of, I just do it, that's all I need to do. I pray, God, that you would, Holy Spirit, be brooding over them, create life, bring life to this person, bring life to me, bring life to us all, Lord God, that we would live by the Spirit and not by the flesh, that we'd be well-pleasing. Lord, I thank you that you've sent your son to forgive us of our sins, that we can be with you forever. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We know you're good. Amen.